We're now going to look at a topic that's of interest to all teaching. How do you know what to teach? And this is these days formulated in terms of needs. What are the needs uh, that we're going to respond to? Now, simply, we could look for needs in various places. What you teach depends on, well, let's guess who your students are. That's the most obvious one, I think. Who's in front of you? How are we going to teach them? What do they want to know? However, it also depends on exactly what they're looking for as a group and where they want to go in the future. Also, it depends on what you're able to teach, which means what resources do you have and what competencies do you have? Unfortunately, for some, we work in institutions, and a lot depends on what the education institution wants, the place that's setting up our interaction. It's not just between me and you, teacher, student. The institution also has its say. Now, for example, at the University of Melbourne, we have to make a profit, usually. In other institutions, Religion can be important, and religious training can be important. In other institutions, political ideologies may be important. And then, since the students are going somewhere, and particularly if we're working at master level, which is the front door towards employment, we would look at what the labour market wants and get information on that if we can. That's not quite the same thing, though, as what the profession wants. Uh, what should we be doing, for example, to improve the public image and status of translators and interpreters as collectivities? You see that very quickly, this simple question, uh, what do we teach, depends on a whole lot of factors. And if we pursue, for example, that last one, what the profession wants, we find models like this. This is coming out of Taiwan, but it proposes that our mission is to move from a space of market disorder, where nobody knows who translators are and translators are not well paid, to uh, a paradise down here of a protected profession, a protected and autonomous, that means independent profession, uh, like lawyers, architects, doctors, etc. Okay, that's, that's a clear cause. Now look at the role of training institutions. We have a key role there with respect to getting consensus about what translation is, and we're in, a, in touch with professional associations and directly through the associations in teaching codes of conducts. And then there are all the other instances that play a role here. Okay, now that's one map. That's not the definitive map. That's an elaboration of just this last element here. So you could probably do that kind of mapping for each of these and get a very, very complex network of factors that are involved. Let me just focus for a minute here on the central role of the professional association, which should correspond to more than just monetary needs. Let me talk for a moment about translator training in Australia, since that's where we are, whether we want to be here or not. It is interesting that the history of translator training in Australia goes back to a 1975 report on poverty. Yes, that's right, poverty. Poverty, poor people in Australia, were found to be predominantly among the indigenous population and recent immigrant families. And in both cases, language difficulties were one of the key points leading to isolation from social services and social mobility. That's where the awareness comes from. Look at the date there, 1975. Two years later, we have what we now know as NATI, which is the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters. 
but its reason for coming into being was to address the problem of social exclusion. And its prime focus, for that very reason, has been what we would call community interpreting or dialogue interpreting. And Australia then became one of the leaders, in, for example, in telephone interpreting. It was to enhance the delivery of social services. That's where we come from. And, and if you understand that, then you'll understand a lot of what Nati is today and why, for example, for many, many years, uh, translator training in Australia was in TAFEs, in the technical colleges, uh, to give people skills to go and help their communities. It wasn't in a high-level technical translation. It wasn't in high-level conference interpreting. Indeed, when I studied in Australia in the 1970s, if I'd wanted to do translation, I would have been working with Aboriginal languages. That was the only place where people were really, really working on translation as anything like an independent set of skills. I, I regret sometimes that I didn't. If we compare this with China, contemporary China, we find a very different set of needs. And the frontline needs uh, would be, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is a foreign policy initiative. Australia was looking inwards at the causes of poverty within the country. Uh, China these days is looking outwards. It's wanting to exert its soft power. The favorite phrase is to tell the China story to the world. And for that sort of export of a culture, you're looking for stars like Zhang Lu, for example, top flight conference interpreting. And people are motivated by that image of rising to the top of a profession to go out into the world and advance knowledge of China. Uh, outside of China, that does sort of work for conference interpreting, I must admit. In Australia, we don't have any stars, but we do have Nicole Kidman, who was in a film called The Interpreter. So lots of people still in Australia uh, are motivated to go into translation. You say, why? I want to be an interpreter at the United Nations. Okay. That's good, that's motivation within the system. It's nice to have it, but let's face it, that makes more sense for the Chinese set of demands than it does for the contemporary demands, internal demands within Australia. I want to open an imaginary space in which we can start to think about those different kinds of social demands, okay? So I'm stepping back from all those many, many factors, and I'm trying to think what are the underlying factors that will say when a, a community needs a translator training and interpreter training or, or doesn't, and what kind of, uh, of training they need. Let me put at the top here a society where everyone translates. That means everyone learns all the languages, so they can have conversations, they can understand the other person's language or they can move into that language and you need no professional intermediaries. And the example I use, you'll know this from a, a lecture that I gave in China and I think that's probably available to you in parallel here. If you're interested, uh, I, I refer to the, the island of Waruri which has 450 speakers and five languages and in theory everybody can translate there so they don't need any translator training. Um, in fact, I've discovered that actually there are translators or transla people do translate there, uh, not because they don't know the language, but because some conversations are prohibited. For example, a man cannot have a direct conversation with his mother-in-law or any woman who could be his mother-in-law, uh, so you could use an intermediary. Uh, in that situation. So, so it's not true that, that, that no translators are ever needed or done, but we could imagine that space. At the other end there, at the bottom of this axis, uh, we can put a place where only specialists translate. And this would be from the contact in Lower Egypt, 
in the in the Sudan when we have the first known image of mediators interpreters okay and these are special people in Sparta we know that the translators were a particular family uh, a caste if you like and the position of, of translator or intermediary was hereditary so uh, we can separate societies along that axis okay you'll see what this means in a minute the other axis would be between low intensity high intensity and here I mean how many translations or how much communication is going on between the languages how frequent is it and how important is it so I'm putting those variables together as intensity and here we'll, I'll take an example from research by Alexandra Ashish Rosa uh, translations into Portuguese over a 50-year period there uh, and let's see how they go now these are translations from English and you can see low intensity here uh, and high intensity here um, now let's see low intensity here means you don't need many translators and they're likely to be professionals high intensity here means that you need more translators but it's getting up to the stage where people are likely to be learning English so there are also people who have direct access to the foreign language we'll see what that means in a minute let me just follow the example here uh, that's French and French is a fairly consistent level there and that is a surprising one that's Spanish the Spanish was the most important one now um, there are lots and lots of translations there from Spanish even though the people in Portugal can understand Spanish uh, pretty well and it's interesting to consider why that happened uh, in that particular period uh, there was a dictatorship in both Spain and Portugal you see 1975 it goes right down and the Portuguese regime found it convenient to import literature through Spanish because it had been pre-censored and was therefore reliable so uh, the information flow therefore depended on institutional causes and professional translators were used for that for the same reason in order to control the population and censor the information that was coming in uh, and the last one there is Russian which is a very low level constant presence and you would therefore have just a few translators working for Russian and probably not working consistently okay so that's what I mean by by flows and the flows are very different and the demand for translators depends very much on what that curve looks like for the languages concerned if we put the two axes together yes there we go we've got everyone translates only professionals translate low intensity high intensity we can start getting examples of translator training and putting them on this space or finding a, a, a place for them so the island of Waruri for example they've got fairly frequent communications but no nothing of major importance uh, coming from the outside up there everyone translates over here the position of the translator is uh, hereditary so it's restricted to uh, just a few people and it's fairly low intense intense intensity communication um, ancient Greek society uh, did not have uh, the frequent movements that we have these days uh, between our communities 19th century language learning uh, that we looked at I think what two weeks ago we looked at those textbooks uh, they did include translation as part of what was going on because there was a dominant social class and an upper middle class that was trained in languages that is the major languages of Europe there was fairly frequent uh, movement between those languages and um, people or a so whole social class could do that uh, without needing uh, a lot of independent professional translators writers would translate in their spare time uh, 
uh, upper middle class and, and uh, higher class women particularly would translate as a hobby, uh, as, as an activity that was done there. Okay. Moving down here though, where we have high intensity and the need for professionals, certainly here we get the need for the diplomatic translators, uh, the United Nations interpreters would obviously be right down here. And most of our training these days is, is on the supposition that we are working in this space. Uh, particularly when we're working between major languages in the world, uh, between which there is a lot of, of professional communication going on. In fact, more professional communication than the available uh, professionals can handle. At the same time, though, it's interesting to consider uh, that we also have free online machine translation, which can handle high intensities because people are, are moving much more now that they can, and where everyone translates. Okay, So there's a modality up here, machine translation, which would fit in this space, although it's not the part of learning of languages, not necessarily. I put that there for the people who are in language education, okay, that it's interesting to compare these two spaces. And you can't just say that translator training is only for high professionals these days, I think. Uh, this, this thing, this argument that was used against the role of translation in language learning, the argument that, oh, it's only for professionals and we don't need many professionals, I think we found uh, Jesperson saying this at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, no, if you look in this space, uh, translators have been trained or people have learned about translation in many, many different situations over history. When uh, flows or exchanges between two languages become particularly intense over time, and this is why I'm emphasizing over time here, translation tends not to be a good solution. And I'll just give you this abstract model. It might, might help you think about this a little. We're moving at time, time one, time two, time three, okay? Uh, let me put an example on this. The Olympic Games happens every four years, and the Olympiad is the four-year period between it, okay? So, for example, I worked many years ago for the Barcelona Olympic Games, and I worked as a translator uh, for the Olympiad. So this would be, let's see, uh, four years out here and two years here, okay? Now, uh, to handle the communication costs, and in that Olympiad we had three official languages, French, English, Catalan, and then we worked with Spanish, so there are effectively four. Uh, people invested in translation, and the translation costs are fairly constant. Okay, The translation costs as much here as it does here. In fact, it's a bit more at the beginning, your curve would go down like this, but translation, uh, if it's socially recognized, properly is an expensive item and the cost doesn't go down. So if you're going to translate everything over the four years, it becomes pretty expensive. The policy, however, was to use translation for high-risk texts, but also I first went in there uh, working for them as an English teacher. I was teaching the executives English because the executives, after two years, uh, knew English well enough, so we didn't need as many translations in that language. Okay? Now, at the beginning, if you're in a short-term communication, it is cheaper to translate than to learn a language. If you're going to Thailand to set up a business, get an interpreter to go with you. Don't sit down and learn Thai, because it may be just for two weeks. However, after this T2, it becomes more advantageous to invest in language learning than in translation. So that was T3 would be the four years of the Olympiad. It was smarter to get these people to learn English and therefore there were less costs invested or less uh, expenses, less resources invested in translation than in language learning. Uh, this is just a model to help us think about how the two activities can and are combined. Uh, 
uh, depending on, I think the prime factor is, the intensity of the flow and how long it lasts in time. So, for example, if relations between China and Australia are going to continue for a long time, yes, we do need translators for high-risk communication, but more importantly, we have to learn the language of the other. We have to get our students in schools to be learning English and Chinese. That is the logic of this diagram. Uh, translation does not replace uh, language learning. Language learning does not replace translation. There is no battle between the two. They can be combined in this way. Okay. Uh, now, given that the social needs differ enormously, depending on the, the historical situation and the languages concerned, the responses to them are not immediately transferable. That is, you can't just pick up what is done in Geneva and do it in Melbourne, for example. Or look at the way interpreters are trained for the United Nations and apply that to the training of interpreters for indigenous communities in Australia. It doesn't make sense. So this idea of best practices, that there are some places in the world that do this thing very well, and all we have to do is copy them, doesn't work. It can't work. It'll be doomed to failure. It makes far more sense to look around you at where you are, uh, figure out what the needs are, and then look around for other practices in the world that can help you meet those needs. But there should be no immediately uh, transferable needs. Uh, an example, I mean, if you go through the history of translator training institutions, <clears throat> most of them worked on this supposition of, of transfer. For example, I, I worked um, while I was at the Barcelona Olympic Games, I, I worked at the language school in Barcelona, sorry, language school, the translator training school in Barcelona at the Autonomous University there. Now, they modelled themselves on Mons, which was in Belgium, which was very close to Brussels. And Mons was training translators and interpreters for what was at that stage the, the European community, okay, for inter bureaucratic work in Brussels. <clears throat> Whereas Barcelona is a centre for the Spanish uh, language publishing industry and has a great need of, of people in publishing especially, in design uh, and in general business. So the transfer didn't work. They picked up a model, but they soon found that they had to adapt it. Also in Barcelona, there are two official languages in, in Belgium. Yes, there are two, but Mons only trains in French. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's in Wallonie, it's in that French-speaking part of, uh, of, of, uh, of Belgium. So, if we can't just pick up a best practice, we have to look around and see where we are. Now, the first thing you can do is ask your students, what do you want? You know, day one, what would you like to learn? And I actually do this, as you might know. At the beginning, I will say, what, write three things you'd like to know about translation. I'll do what you want. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing's wrong with it, but it's not truth. Logically, how can a student know what they want until they have experienced it? I mean, you have to find out about translation before you know if you really want it, or what kind of translation you want, okay? So you can't know what you want until you've experienced it. and. If you haven't experienced it, then you're really dealing with images and motivations like, oh, I want to be a conference interpreter at the United Nations, all right? Here's an example of how that question has been answered. I ask, what would you like to learn? You know, write three things you'd like to know. And I'm comparing here, I've done this in Vienna, I've done this in Monterey in those years at different levels. But look at this, in Monterey, these are percentages, okay? Uh, more, uh, double the percentage in Vienna. Vienna, not really interested in technology. Monterey, hey, yeah, we're interested in technology. Why? Why? What's the difference? Well, 
many, many factors come into play, but Monterey just happens to be in California, very close to Silicon Valley. And so people leaving there might look around and say, hey, where would I like to work and get a lot of money? Yeah, Silicon Valley, give me some technology. Okay, so even though they haven't experienced it, uh, people do have motivations and fairly general ideas about what's going on. I've done this same, same question in, uh, in Melbourne, as you can see down here. So this is Vienna, this is Monterey, this is Melbourne. We had not many students there at the beginning. And woof, look what happens. It jumps up a whole lot, okay? in 2018, 2019. Up and down, I must admit, but still, it's much higher than the other two. Why? Well, because we know that machine translation is advancing, people are worried about their jobs, they want to know about it, and so many of the questions do concern technology. So, it's not stupid to ask students what they want. You get an idea of their motivation and their fears. Okay, and that's part of what we have to teach into. Even if it doesn't tell us what we have to teach, it says, I've got to talk about these things because these students are at least worried about it and or motivated by it. Alternatively, we can ask employers. And there's a whole literature out there called uh, bridging the gap or the gap between training and the labor market, the gap between employment. And the first thing these researchers do is go and ask the employers. They seem to think the employers are going to know more than the students. Well, I'm not too sure that they do. The first reason is this. Each employer is in one particular part of the market. Okay. They, uh, they tend to just see their particular part of the market. Uh, more than that, if they're successful, they tend to assume that everybody should become successful in the same way as they became successful in their particular part of the labor market. So, for example, one very prominent uh, uh, employer of translators or owner of a translation company um, is Chris Durbin in Paris, okay, and she will get out there and tell you how to be successful in translation, because she has been very successful in translation. She does uh, financial translations for big companies in Paris. Fair enough. Now, she will tell you that you don't need any translation technology. That's all rubbish. Don't trust the technology. You've got to do it by being an expert in your field. Well, she's not wrong, but she is particularly right for the place where she is in the market and the way she became successful. Uh, you cannot turn around to all these people over here who are worried about technology and say, hey, you know what? Chris Durbin became successful without technology in two, two generations ago, so you shouldn't worry about it. All right, it's one voice, but only one voice. The employers are also given to doing their own publicity. Okay, not just assuming that they are a model of success that others should should imitate, but also uh, saying what they have to say to meet their market. And this is just an example. It's an optimali survey of what employers say they need. Okay, uh, so employers stating that competence in these areas is important or essential. And what's the one at the top of the list? Okay able to produce 100% quality. Now, do you think that's what they look at first when they're employing you as a translator? Okay, more than any of these other things down here. Look at a university degree, it's right down here. They don't care about your university degree. They don't care about your use of technology either. They want 100% quality. But if you've ever worked in a translation company, you'll know that nobody produces 100% quality unless they're getting paid a lot of money. And that for most projects, time, time, the ability to work fast and to work in a team is more important than producing absolute quality. So this is what they have to say to their clients. Every company, translation company around, says we produce 100% quality. 
If they said, oh, we'll only give you 90% quality, they're out of business. So I tend not to believe this kind of survey. I've got, you know, it could be true, but it also looks to me like these are uh, companies uh, restating their publicity uh, rather than looking at the real reasons why they employ one person or another or at the nature of work within the companies. Anyway, uh, that's to be taken with a grain of salt, just as the students' uh, opinions are to be taken with a grain of salt. Let me move to, to a next, uh, the next factor. Uh, what resources do we have? Okay, um, it's, it's a weird thing, this, you know, for example, we can train conference interpreters. You can do this with free software on a, on a laptop. You can train conference interpreters with free software. It can be done. But the institutions that train conference interpreters are all spending millions building uh, labs or with booths where a mini conference center with fancy booths, it's in all their publicity. Uh, we at the University of Melbourne are looking at this right now and we're aware that we don't really need it to do the training, but you do really need it to attract the good students and to get their parents to pay a lot of money, okay? So resources are sort of the real resources and then the, the publicity uh, image type resources that one needs. Anyway, uh, I was going to talk about something a bit different here. Uh, this is a survey that Esther Torres and I did of um, EMT, European Master of Translation programs. Uh, so these are all European programs. And one of our questions concerned uh, what percentage of language pair specific contact hours are involved. So for example, in our Master of Translation for Chinese, uh, about 80% of your subjects are specific to Chinese English translation. And we need experts in Chinese English translation to teach them. So you come out, hopefully, with high level skills in the techniques of Chinese English translation. But if you go to the United Kingdom, uh, you can study other things, such as intercultural communication, uh, translation theory, more translation theory, translation research methods. Uh, and you can avoid um, specific translation classes. So for example, uh, the, the dark blue shows the minimum requirement. So the highest one here, Manchester, 25%. Melbourne is up 80%, okay? Right, right, going right down to, to Surrey, you can avoid it, and Hull, you can do a translation master with no languages at all. Well, in English, okay? So, <clears throat> and, and then the, the light blue, uh, what's available, okay? So for these masters, what they can do is, is get in the lots of Chinese students. Let's, let's pick at this one, okay? 11%, somewhere around here. 11%, uh, and we put in all the other languages into one space for 89% of the classes, and only 11% are for you in Chinese. Why would we do that? Well, we save a whole lot of money because we get our classes full, okay, with the Chinese and the other languages together. Uh, if we're at 80%, we can't do that. We have to have separate classes for the students. But if we've got lots of non-language specific classes, then it's lucrative. So, and our resources are low. We don't have to employ so many teachers who are specialized. So underlying this model, perhaps I haven't explained it too well, but uh, there's a report available for you on this. Uh, what's underlying it is, as at the University of Melbourne, uh, the need to make money, specifically to make money from the illusions, you know, the illusions, the motivations of uh, Chinese students at the moment. Okay, so much for resources. Yu Ha is, uh, or has completed a survey of where our graduates go uh, from the University of Melbourne's uh, Master of Translation. 
Uh, and this is another way of getting information. What do students need? Well, probably they need things that will um, let them uh, follow the steps of, of where our graduates go. It's not a logical consequence, but it's good information to have. So we've asked 77 graduates, what kinds of jobs have you attained since graduating? Okay, and here's what we find. And this is actually fairly consistent over all the surveys that I've seen, um, at least in, in Europe uh, and some in the United States. Monterey is a little different. Okay, We find that about one third go into translation and interpreting. We're doing a Master of Translation, but a third go into translation and interpreting there, putting those two together. This one is language teaching, and this is use of languages for other purposes. So that the skills you learn with languages are used for a wide range of many other things, which can be public relations, company promotion. Um, one person became an air traffic controller. Anything can happen there. And then there's a wide range of others. Okay. What's important here is that we become aware that even though we think we are training for a particular market, the translation market, and therefore we go and speak to the employers as if they knew, the sad reality, not the most sad, the happy reality is that we are training for a very wide range of professions, including teaching. So this separation of translation from teaching doesn't make much sense in sociological terms. Also, even though we're in Melbourne, even though we're endorsed by Natty, we don't really train for the local market. Question 48. In which cities or towns have you lived since graduating? Well, quite a few are actually in Melbourne and stay there, but we're in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and other places in China. So when we train you, we have to be aware of a market here, obviously, and a market here, obviously. Okay, so the conceptual space that I presented there doesn't allow for any simple unitary solution. We have to think in at least two dimensions, and we have to think of the other jobs uh, that uh, our graduates are going towards. Newhouse research is quite complex and we will go into it later, I think, if we, when we look at, at skills and competencies. I'll just point out here that uh, these are the people who become translators. These are the language workers, including the, uh, the teachers, and these are the others. Okay, it's three neat groups there. Now, the hardcore translation skills are in red. Okay. And they're at the top there for the people who are translating and interpreting. Uh, look, they're much lower down here and much lower down here. The skills in green, project management skills, documentation, critical thinking, risk management, communication skills, uh, these are the, the process or the know-how skills not related with the translation as a product. They are present in, translator, in people who become translators but very present up here, very present up here. Uh, and the current thinking uh, on translator training, at in Europe at least, is that we should be doing more to train you in these communication skills uh, than in just the hardcore translation skills, simply because it's needed by the market. Also, I, I make the argument that the uh, use of uh, neural machine translation means that a lot of our work goes into not just post editing but also cross-cultural communication uh, in the sense of talking about the other culture organizing teams doing the communicating in a very wide sense of translation okay uh, so I, I think that the the impact of, of machine translation will also move us up towards these kinds of skills Okay, is, is, uh, is that gospel truth? Are these the real needs? No, here we're using data from many different sources to try to piece together an idea of the training that we need. 
looking at all these different factors, you can privilege whichever one you want. There, there's no gospel truth there. I do, however, continue to ask students what they want to know at the beginning. And, and I do this firstly because each group I have in front of me is different. And secondly, because it upsets models of competence planning. Okay, where prior to seeing any human student, we have to draw up our lessons and, and name the learning objectives and organize them in terms of the learning objectives of the master. This, this you know, socialist five-year planning of, of, of competencies, uh, as if it's all rigid and, and the incoming students have to fit into it. I, I think that it's important to look at the students in front of us and ask them each year, what do they want? and to take that seriously and address their questions. And I modify, I modify the teaching in accordance with that. Okay? Why do I do that? Because the one thing we do know about learning, language learning especially, but also across the board, is that motivation is the most valuable asset. So you, you have to get people uh, into a situation where they're learning stuff they really care about. And if it's corresponding to the things they say they want to learn, they will care about it and learning will proceed. If you rely too heavy on the other indicators of needs, I suggest you may risk having students lose motivation. Even if this means we are not manufacturing skills that fit into the labor market. I think we are at a university. The function of the university is not to produce little blocks that fit into the machinery of industry. Our function at the university is to think critically about what's happening in the wider society. And that, I think, should be an institutional need that overrides all other needs.